welcome to our study in Australia Masterclass. My name is Paulo de Souza. I'm a professor and head of the School of ICT at Griffith University. When we talk about Mars, there are a number of reasons for why we should do this type of research. So the Masterclass of today is to talk to you about why we should go to Mars. What kind of technology are we developing and what you should expect in the years to come. It is an international endeavor, but Australia is playing a key role in the exploration of deep space and there will be a lot of opportunities for you to understand, develop your knowledge in the area and be part of this fantastic journey of the exploration of the space in the universe. When we talk about Mars, there are a number of reasons for why we should do this type of research. Why should we explore the deep space and why we should go to another planet to understand better the evolution of our solar system and what happens there? And the answer comes back 500 years ago when we thought we were at the center of the universe and everything has to turn around us. But the observations from scientists at that time told us that actually we are turning around the sun. And that was a shock for us, for women beings, to understand that we are no longer at the center of the universe and we are not that important as we thought. We came in peace with that information and we said, okay, let's call our son the King Astro. And we forgot about it for about 300 years when scientists is looking at the light emitted by stars and the light emitted by our sun. They realized they are the same nature the very same type of light. So the question was, at that time, are stars just a sun? Our sun, just another star, it looks much bigger, much brighter, just because it's nearby? And the answer is yes. How many stars do we have in the universe? We have more stars in the universe than grains of sand in all beaches of our planet. That gives you a sense of scale of the universe and how many stars we have out there. But this is the only star that we know that has planets around. And that was true literally until yesterday, in the 80s, when we discovered another planet turning around another star. So this exoplanet was then discovered, and today with missions like Kepler, we have hundreds of solar systems already known. And what's next? Do we live in the only planet with life and with intelligent life? Though I doubt there is intelligent life on Earth, but anyways, the fact is that the sense of why life exists, how life could have been formed on Earth, was there any other places in the universe where life could have, have emerged? Do we have the privilege to be the only planet in this entire universe with life? Well, it's statistically, it's very hard to say so. And we are looking for places where potentially life could once have been formed. Mars is a very good candidate for life because in the past, there might be some evidences sitting right there that will show us that the fundamental ingredients for life was once present. There were water, energy, and nutrients. If you have these three components together, life will try to emerge, will strive, will evolve, will create ecosystems. This is exactly what we have seen on Earth. Are we that privileged that this is the only place where we see life? And that answer that came 500 years ago, that are we alone in the universe, how life was formed, where we were formed and how life is sustained and what would happen to our planet going forward are questions that we are trying to answer when we send probes to Mars. Mars has been playing a quite key role in our imagination. If you, if you look at the studies done by the Italian astronomer Chiaparelli, uh, trying to interpret images from Mars, um, 
since the 19th century, you would see that he's talking about potential civilization or channels and things like that on the surface of Mars. Uh, we do also have a lot of uh, fiction uh, playing on. For example, the work from Orson Welles with the War of the Woods and everything that happened a long time ago there in New York during a broadcast of the Halloween night. And you can imagine the big TV at the time was a radio station and he was reading about Martians coming to Earth and invading us. And we have people uh, literally scared and, and that was a big thing at the time. And again, playing with our imagination. And we only had images literally coming late in the 60s from telescopes. Um, about everything that we knew about Mars. We see a planet that it's, it's interesting, has some interesting colors in. We see a uh, ice cape, so like the South Pole and the North Pole. But we are trying to understand the planet evolution mainly through images. Until we sent Marina, the first mission that was able to fly by and then collect the first images taken from a satellite on the surface of Mars. And those images then allow us to understand a little bit better of the landscape on the surface of that planet. We landed on Mars for the first time with the Vikings. Uh, these two landers uh, were like a dual mission that was turning around Mars first. So we have the orbiter taking images of the surface of Mars and then landing on the surface with two landers. And what we found there was literally a big desert. There was nothing available on the surface of Mars that could indicate like a little bush, maybe a Martian saying hi to the cameras. There was nothing. That big desert, actually a place that probably never saw water, was there. And that was literally a uh, big disencouragement for us to seek for life beyond Earth on Mars. Until 1984, we literally forgot about Mars. In 1984, NASA had a mission that was sent to Antarctica to collect meteorites. Antarctica is a great place to find meteorites, not only because you have ice everywhere, it's very easy to spot rocks, but also the movement of the ice brings those rocks to the rim of large uh, mountains. And in one of those Rocks was, of course, a meteorite called Allen Hills, where they found it in 84. It comes from there because another big meteorite hit the surface of Mars, ejected parts of rocks from that planet to space, and some of them were big enough to come through our atmosphere and fall, and then we will be able to take that little rock. The analysis of the radioisotopes it's like a DNA analysis from where that came from could tell us that was not from the moon, was not from this kind of other meteorites we have around, was actually from Mars, confronting with data from Vikings. We could see it. It was actually a Martian rock. And that Martian rock was made of carbonate. Carbonate is a mineral that needs water to be formed. So there was water on Mars is an indirect evidence. Sometime in the past, billions of years ago, there was water there. But not only this, when you cut that rock and look through scanning electron microscopes, very powerful microscopes, you will see tiny structures that resemble bacteria. That bacteria is an indirect evidence of life. That discovery was so important, so impactful, that the White House at the time, Bill Clinton, had a press conference and presented the discovery to the world and said that maybe this is our first encounter with life beyond Earth, with extraterrestrial life. And announced then that we will go back and the Americans will be leading that effort to go back to Mars. Then in 1997, we landed again on Mars with a mission called Mars Pathfinder with a small rover called Sojourner. That rover was about the size of a microwave oven. We landed on the surface of Mars and guess what we found? The same rocks that we found back with Vikings. Just a desert. There was no water present. What's going on? 
probably we landed in the wrong spots. Instead of landing on a place that would be a lot of evidences that was a notion in the past, we were landing on places that were always dry. So there was an international effort to send then a number of orbiters, satellites to Mars to take photos of the surface to help us to select where we should land with rovers or with landers with new missions. So the out of 174 potential places to land with future missions, taking into account things like presence of large rocks that could damage the lander or the potential evidences of a lacustrine place or a place that was a lake in the past or a notion, geomorphical evidences that water was present. So those places were selected, not of them, two were selected to land with the next mission, with the mass exploration hovers. With two hovers, one called Spirit, that was landed at Gusev Crater, and with Opportunity at the Meridiani Planum. And then in 2003, we sent those two rovers uh, from Cape Canaveral to Mars, and there we landed in January 2004 with these two rovers. The Spirit was the first one to land. Um, we, after exploring the surface of Mars for quite a long time with them, we found no evidences of presence of water there. It took almost a year to find something. But with opportunity, it was a completely different picture. As soon as we landed, the first samples that we were able to analyze with the spectrometers and all the instruments on board, we found the evidences of two minerals, gerocide and hematite, that need a lot of water to be formed. And that was the evidence that Mars had the most important element for life, water. So the strategy adopted by the space agencies is follow the water. And that was then the discovery that came through, uh, through the spectrometers that were on board. But then what happened over the decade and a half following this mission was a successful picture or a very detailed picture of different minerals on the surface of Mars, showing that water was present in so many forms, very acidic environment, huge oceans with a lot of salt in the water. We found hot springs uh, showing that there was this energy also present in some places. Fresh water, a number of different forms of water was present. Then what happened to all this water? Why Mars was so rich in water and it's dry today? And probably there are a number of uh, hypotheses for that. And one of those that we most accept is that through the time, Mars lost its magnetic field and losing its magnetic field, then it lost protection against the sunstorms. And that sunstorms with particles literally removed the atmosphere. And then we increase again, we evaporate, the water from the surface and wash again and evaporate and take it away. So this degasification process of the atmosphere mass was taking the water away from a liquid form to a gas form and then losing that to space. And that's probably likely uh, the most accepted theory. And of course, we might have still water present in the capes and also on the ground, but we don't know yet. What I'm going to take you now, it's uh, what kind of disciplines, what kind of professionals do we need to put a mission on the surface of Mars and some of the challenges that we have to make that happen. And that will definitely show you opportunities that you would have to explore there through your career. Technology has evolved a lot in the space exploration. Uh, when we talk about rovers, just to give an example, the Rover Sojourner that landed on Mars in 1997 was about the size of this microwave oven. Spirit and Opportunity were about the size of a golf chart. And Curiosity and Perseverance that are operational right now on the surface of Mars about the size of a minivan. And that brought a lot of challenges as well. 
For example, for you to operate rovers on the surface of Mars, because Mars is so far away that even at speed of light, you need 20 minutes to get the information there. So if you imagine that I'm going to make a phone call to the rover, you take the phone and say, hello, it's going to take 20 minutes for the rover to hear that. And of course, it's going to take another 20 minutes for you to say the, to hear the rover saying back, hi. So messaging the rover, sending comments to the rover, if I want to drive it right, and I take something and say, turn right, it's going to take 20 minutes for the rover to receive that turn right, an additional 20 minutes for you to see that happened. So it's impossible to drive the hover in, in real time. What we actually do, we send a list of comments, of activities that we would like that machine to do on the surface of Mars. And then the hover will receive at once, execute that throughout the day autonomously. And then at the end of that day, take some images, get the results prepared, and send that back to us. And sending back to us take another 20 minutes, and then we have some hours to analyze the results, prepare the new list of comments, and then send that back to the rover. Now, what kind of professionals do we need to make that happen? So we need definitely ICT professionals to process the image that you collect. You need roboticists, you need electronics and electrical engineers to work on that. You need material scientists to work on the best possible materials that will resist the extreme temperatures that you would face on the surface of Mars on being, for example, 100 degrees negative at night to 10 degrees positive at the day, that huge thermal variation every single day, your machine has to go through that and survive. So you need to understand what materials will better survive that extreme environment. You need geologists. Essentially, the rovers are geologists looking at rocks, sniffing rocks and soil and getting information about them. You need chemists, you need biologists to um, sterilize the hover and protect everything we sent to space um, from terrestrial life. So every piece of machine you sent to the surface of Mars, you want to protect the surface, the other planet, from terrestrial life. So you need to sterilize it as best as possible before you send that to another planet. All those professional activities will need to be brought together to realize a mission like this. And I'm talking just about the exploration of Mars. Of course, there are so many other things that can be done. But you know that one third of all data transmitted to Mars and that came back from Mars here, one third of every data image, everything came through Australia. So we have a node of the deep space network is a set of antennas that are so big and so powerful that it can send information to a small machine sitting on the surface of another planet. Or you can receive information from a small antenna sitting on the surface of Mars or a uh, satellite orbiting Mars and send that back to Earth. So those big antennas, one of those are here in Australia and you can literally communicate with the deep space. is what we call the deep space network. So we need also radio telescopes and we need a lot of information for you to get information from the universe and also about the surface of other planets like Mars or even on, on the moon. So all the deep space uh, network is possible thanks to of course, a number of uh, electronics and, and electrical engineering. And we do have a world-class capability here in Australia that enabled that since early ages of the uh, space program to allow us to communicate with hovers and landers and orbiters that are on the surface of, of Mars orbiting Mars. Now, one important aspect that if you look to the future, we see a number of not only missions that will be landing there, characterizing the surface, but they will be able also to bring samples back to Mars. The hover from NASA called Perseverance that has instruments that were also built by part of the team here working in Queensland. They were able to 
characterize samples and say, oh my God, this sample looks so interesting. I would like to learn more about this piece of rock from the surface of Mars. I wish I could bring it back to Earth and put that into advanced equipments like the cyclotron accelerator that we have in, in Victoria, in Melbourne, here in Australia, and make a full characterization because I can't miniaturize a particle accelerometer. I can't miniaturize some powerful microscopes. There are some instruments that would be vital to tell us more about those samples that we cannot miniaturize. So it would be great if we could bring those rocks back here. And this is exactly what that hover is doing. It's looking at rocks, finding interesting rocks that we will put inside a capsule leave them behind and bring those samples back in the future. So there will be another mission coming that will land on the surface of Mars, bring those samples inside a small rocket, and then send that sample back to Earth so we will be able to characterize them. Scientists that will be analyzing them will be probably today in high school. Those are the ones that will be doing a PhD in a few years' time, analyzing those rocks right here in the labs of uh, across Australia with our universities. So there are a number of opportunities for you to be involved in that uh, endeavor of exploring, uh, exploring Mars. So when we're gonna see men and women walking on the surface of Mars, that's gonna take a little while. It's not something we're gonna see this decade, but probably within the next 20 years or so, we might see first astronauts walking on the surface of Mars. But it's not easy. I can tell you today, we don't have the technology that would allow us to do it. Uh, let's just take you through some of the challenges that you might face if you want to go to Mars. So let's imagine that you've got a boarding pass to go to Mars, why not? right? You will be launching from a very powerful rocket, and that rocket is going to accelerate enormously. There will be a lot of vibrations, and you can imagine how it is taking you out of our orbit, probably towards the moon, where you're going to meet some fellow astronauts that are there in a permanent station that will welcome you, stay there for a while, and then get you on another rocket to go to to Mars. You cannot go to Mars anytime. There is a very specific boarding time to Mars, and that happens for a couple of months every 26 months. It's when Earth and Mars are very close together. There are times that Mars and Earth are opposite sides of the sun, so you cannot go there that easily. It's too far away. So the easiest way is when they are very close. When they are close, it's possible for you to go and, and, and travel to Mars or send probes to Mars. This is what we do. So well, let's imagine that you are in that specific window of opportunity to go, and then you jump into a rocket, go to Mars. It's going to take you approximately seven months to get there, maybe a little bit longer. You have to be in a very small spacecraft, probably with one or two extra astronauts with you. Can you imagine staying in a room, literally about the size of a bus, let's say a mini bus, for seven months? Everything is in there. You can use the same toilet, you can use the same kitchen, and you have to have the same conversations every uh, I can't say day because it's not going to have night and day, night and day all the time. So it's going to be really challenging. There is also the absence of gravity. It can bring a lot of problems to us. You may create an artificial gravity by you know, uh, turning you around a given core. Uh, once you get close to Mars, you have to get into orbit and stay there for a while and be sure that all the systems are ready for you to go and land on the surface. But at that time, you will be already too far away to come back to Earth. You won't be able to talk in real time with your family. You can't take the phone and call for the reasons that I said, it's too far away. So the only way for you to communicate with someone is to record short videos or voice messages and then send that package and then you wait for somebody to respond a few hours later. 
So it's not possible to have a conversation with your family or with control mission back on Earth. And you still you will rely on the deep space network to operate really well to ensure that you can talk back to Earth and receive comments, advice, and, and send messages to your, your friends and colleagues back here in the family. Once you're there, you can't come back. As I said, you have to stay there for approximately one year before you would have another wind of opportunity to fly back from Mars to Earth. And there we go again, taking the flight back. It's going to be a long one, a long journey. Again, inside this is small capsule that is going to take you and France back, hopefully safely back to Earth with a lot of rocks, samples, and, and a few other things that you have from the surface of Mars, but definitely good memories, I hope. And that is just the start of that. We don't have ways yet to ensure that the all the sustaining life systems that you will need to have water, food, oxygen, everything working to perfection to allow you to go there and return safely. Everything we have done that long we did with uh, space stations standing around here orbiting low orbit, what we call LEO, low Earth orbit. Earth about 450 kilometers above us. So the International Space Station is an example of one of those that have six up to seven astronauts turning shifts and coming and leaving constantly. But if anything goes wrong, you can just jump in a capsule and just fly back. You can talk in real time. Now, that won't be possible. If something goes wrong, you have to fix it. There is no way that you can just fly back because depending on when that happens, it will be just impossible for you to get back to Earth safely. So these are just some of the small challenges and how you're going to produce food for that long because you cannot carry everything, how you're going to purify the water and ensure that you have water supply, how you're going to have redundancies in your uh, systems there. It is going to be challenging. How you're going to shield your spacecraft against cosmic radiation that can really damage electronics and can cause harm to us. So a number of challenges. And if you look back to universities, let's say in Australia, from psychology, biology, medicine, uh, physiotherapy, chemistry, physics, engineering, mathematics, we need all those disciplines and there will be a, a multidisciplinary effort brought together to make something like a space mission possible to have astronauts once working on the surface of Mars. So all those aspects are required and are needed. And we don't have yet the technology to make that happen. So the exploration of Mars would also require a lot of development, a lot of research. And one key aspect of all that research that we do is to bring research back to Earth. For example, the uh, broadband communications that we have today based on fiber or based on copper is going to be wireless in the future. You're going to have a Wi-Fi broadcast directly through satellites without the need of a cable. Whenever you go, everywhere you are, you literally will have a Wi-Fi coverage provided by a constellation of satellites here. Most of that development in many ways are based into things that we develop for deep space communications. So there is a lot of maturity that comes from technology in bringing those benefits back to Earth. Uh, looking at the way we manage our ecosystems. We do disaster management better. We do weather forecast, even transactions in ATMs and banks that needs a specific time tag to be happening, to be registered accordingly, needs the space technology. Smart agriculture, mining, incredibly different from what you see 20 years ago and what you see and witness today with robotics, automation, tracking assets, looking at resources on Earth. Everything is being transformed. Every single industry is a space industry and needs some input from space to bring extraordinary value and make Earth a place that we can live better. 
all the efforts in looking at the sky and being admired and being so uh, driven through the exploration of the universe is actually with our feet down here on Earth and looking at ways that we can explore and use that space technology back here and make a difference. So we use the same instruments that we applied to analyze rocks on the surface of Mars to analyze rock paintings of Aboriginal arts back here in Australia. We use the same technology to analyze the contamination of waterways to understand how we could have deposit of heavy metals in estuaries using small robots and using the same sensors that we used in space down here on Earth. There are a number of examples of that. So we don't just explore universe, but especially in Australia, we look at how can we make use of all this effort and all this huge investment done internationally for the benefit of our environment, for our, our industries right here in our communities. It is a very interesting characteristic of the Australian Academy and the Australian researchers is that we are always thinking about how can we create some impact right now, right here, and prepare the future generations to have a better planet, a better one that we have today. If you look at the dimensions of the universe and the size of the universe and the technology stage we have today, we are just at the beginning of the exploration. We are literally coming out of the caves yet, if you consider the size of the universe and the scale and the distances. We are only able, you might be wondering, how can we land things on the surface of Mars and explore another planet? But this is literally nothing. We are not moving from one grain of the sand to the next yet. We are just going to the next planet nearby, or maybe to an astronaut nearby, but everything nearby. So it's still a lot to be discovered, and there is a lot yet to be explored. The future looks really great for anyone that wants to be part of this journey, wants to be part of the space industry. So this is growing exponentially and will open opportunities for international careers to happen. I could see really by working on space exploration how important is the contribution from different nations and people from different backgrounds to make it successful. It's the diversity plane in many ways. And being an academic, I, I was born in Brazil and I worked in Australia for more than a decade. And I feel incredibly welcome here. I think that is a very important thing to consider when you look for a destination for your studies to see if you are going to be welcome. And Australia is a place to come. I feel incredibly welcome. I am in the Southern Hemisphere as I am in Brazil. I look at the sky, it's the same sky that I had in my childhood. But also I can see in the eyes of everyone in the streets and everyone at the university where I work and colleagues at research organizations that I collaborate with, incredibly welcoming. That makes a big difference. And we have students and academics and professionals from all parts of the world working together for a common goal, which is essentially to develop the next generation of professionals that will make a big difference there, that will create an impact, and will make us all proud of the achievements that we have obtained. I hope you will be part of that impact messaging, and I hope that you will be inspired and be part of a certainly bright future that we can offer. It's out there, ready for liftoff, and let's lift off your career. Thank you for listening to our Study in Australia virtual masterclass. My name is Paulo de Souza. I am a professor at Griffith University in Queensland, Australia. 